right, good. All right, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is where we're going to be. We're going to be picking up where we left off last week. Um, I just want to say a brief word, though. It's, uh, again, as, pa- excuse me, as Pastor Chris said, um, what a special day Memorial Day weekend is. I think sometimes it gets overshadowed as being like the kickoff to vacation, but, uh, but really we understand what it means and, and what an honor it is to be able to, to be a pastor and serve in a local church in a community that has such a deep military history. And so I want to say uh, just thank you for those of you who, uh, who have sacrificed your time, sacrificed your, your, uh, your time in the military and, and where you are now. Many are retired. Some of you are still active duty. And uh, we thank you for your family and the sacrifice they make. But as Pastor Chris said, um, we don't want to forget those who their families don't even know where their loved ones are. Um, or those who have gone before us to fight for the freedoms that we enjoy today. And so can we just give one more round of applause in honor of all of our veterans and honoring those for Memorial Day. All right, and uh, so if you're uh, watching us online, I want to welcome you, and uh, thank you for tuning in to us. If you're at the beach, we pray that it's raining just as hard there as it is right here, because that's what you get for skipping church, you know what I'm saying? But uh, no, that's fine. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is where we're going to be. We're glad that you're tuning us in online, wherever you're at, and glad that everybody's here this morning. Um, I I want to start out with this. Let's see if y'all can finish it. I can't get no... Satisfaction, all right? That's one of the most popular songs in history of rock and roll, pretty much in the history of music. It was made popular by who? Rolling Stones. All right, we're good. We're tracking. See, I know a few things about history. And it's, again, regarded as one of the most popular rock songs (laughs) of all time. I'm going to just skip that, all right? So here's what this lyric deals with. If you listen to the song, many of you know it, I'm sure. But if you listen to the song, uh, what Mick Jagger saw in that song and what he's describing in that song are two sides of a coin when it comes to America, the real and the fake. And so this song is about a man who is looking for uh, authenticity, but is not being able to find it through this haze of marketing, this continual bombarding of you need this and you need that to satisfy you, and he can't be satisfied. And, and so that's when I, when I think about that, I think about... Solomon here in Ecclesiastes. Remember, we're, we're reading this book that's really what many believe is, is the very journal of Solomon, the king, who has access to all these things, but yet he doesn't seem satisfied. Ecclesiastes wrestles with the deepest questions, some of the deepest questions of life, and again, he's still left empty. A king who had it all has access to everything, and yet we see he's dealing with some emptiness. And so if you've been tracking with us throughout this series, Ecclesiastes is at times not the most encouraging book in the Bible. And in fact, as Pastor Jeff was telling me, he said, man, we're leading a series where I just feel like everybody leaves like they've been getting punched in the face. And I said, well, you know, that's true to some degree, but I pray today that you'll see a little bit of encouragement based on the wisdom that's here. Again, wisdom literature is just so different and so we really have to dive in. And so I'm praying today as we dive into this study that, uh, that God will give us wisdom. One of the things I love about the book of Ecclesiastes, though, is its honesty. It's honesty. It asks the questions that you and I deal with on a daily basis. I, I saw an article the other day. It was a Lifeway article, and it said that mo- about 50-some percent of Americans wrestle with the question of what happens after life, something that we think about constantly. And so we're going to see that very thing come up here today. Remember, he's already said that life is meaningless. In in Ecclesiastes 1.14, he said, I've seen all things done under the sun have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind, right? So when you read stuff like that, you're like, what's the point? Why why are we here? And and, and what are we to do? And so this morning, as we we look at starting in verse 16 of chapter 3, we're going to go all the way through to uh, the first three verses of chapter 4. And he's going to continue this talk that we, that we started last week about time, and there's a season for things. Well, today he's going to shift a little bit, and he's going to talk a little bit about life and a little bit about death. And so I want to frame this message this morning in really two questions. Number one, is there hope in life? Is there hope in life? And then the second question is, is there hope in eternity? So is there hope in life, and is there hope in eternity? And so if you're physically able... 
and you have a copy of God's Word, whether it be a physical copy or you've got your phone, if we could, let's stand together. and We're going to read this text this morning in full, and then let's lean in to the wisdom that's offered here in this book. Here's what the Word of the Lord says, beginning in chapter 3, verse 16, in the book of Ecclesiastes. It said, I also observed under the sun, there is wickedness at the place of judgment, and there is wickedness at the place of righteousness. I said to myself, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, since there's a time for every activity and every work. I said to myself, this happens so that God may test the children of Adam, and they may see for themselves that they're like animals. For the fate of the children of Adam and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other, and they all have the same breath. People have no advantage over animals, since everything is futile. All are going to return to the same place. All come from dust, and all return to dust. Who knows if the spirit of the children of Adam go upward, and the spirit of animals go downward to the earth? I have seen that there is nothing better than for a person to enjoy his activities, because that is his reward. For who can enable him to see what will happen after he dies? Again, I observe the acts of the oppression being done under the sun, and look at the tears of those who are oppressed. They have no one to comfort them. Power is with those who oppress them. They have no one to comfort them. So I command the dead who have already died, or commend the dead who have already died, more than the living who are still alive. But better than either of them is the one who has not yet existed and who has not seen evil activity done under the sun. Welcome to church. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. Give us wisdom, Lord. You've placed this text in our midst today for a reason. Encourage us. Lord, teach us. Help us to be wise. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So what I want to argue today, kind of the main theme here, is that life is meaningless unless there's a Savior to redeem it. Life is meaningless unless there's a Savior to redeem it. So let's, let's consider these couple of questions. So is there hope in life? Let's go back to verse 16. He says, I observed under the sun that there's wickedness at the place of judgment, and there's wickedness at the place of righteousness. So what's, what's going on here? Well, the teacher begins to look out at the world as he, as he knows it, and he sees that in places where things should be right, that they're actually not. And, and places like the courts, where things should be fair and balanced and, and free from, from any kind of impartiality, but they're actually filled with corruption and evil. People who are innocent are being charged with crimes that they never committed. Murderers are able to walk away and not be found guilty because they have the ability to pay off lawyers and judges to earn their freedom. Larger businesses in this context are, are preying on the vulnerable because no one's going to place them on trial. And even if they are placed on trial because they have the, the money and the backing, the judge is almost going to always rule in favor of the more powerful person. This is what Solomon's considering in this moment when he makes that statement about things not being right where it should be. And if that's not bad enough, not only are these injustices being done, but he's saying no one seems to care about it. No one's going to do anything about it. When reflecting on this passage, the great reformer Martin Luther, he says this. He says that the teacher is not complaining because there's wickedness in the place of justice, but because the wickedness in the place of justice cannot be corrected. And in fact, we see in Ecclesiastes 4, 1 through 3, Solomon goes as far as to say that you're better off not existing or either being dead than to have to be in this world. He says again in verse 1 of chapter 4, I've observed all the acts of oppression under the sun. And he said, look at the tears of those who are oppressed. They have no one to comfort them. Powers with those who oppress them. They've got no one to comfort them. So I, I commended the dead who have already died, the more, uh, more than the living who are still alive. And then in verse 3, it's better to be either of them, the one who's yet existed, who has not seen the evil activity under the sun. So we see here this battle between what is right and what is wrong, this, this good and evil in places where it should be fair, where judges should rule appropriately and they're not. This was like, some believe, 4,000 years ago. Not much has really changed. If you go to the FBI website, 
you can go and look up countless examples of corruption in our country. The court systems that are so bad, or county systems and court systems that are so bad that the state couldn't handle it, they had to go and bring in the FBI, which of course we know as of late, the FBI is even corrupt, right? So you, you see this at multiple levels. One example took place in South Carolina. In 1944, a 14-year-old boy was arrested for the murder of two young girls, allegedly for the murder of two young girls. He was interrogated without a parent or a lawyer. He was put on trial. The trial lasted three hours, and he was executed immediately after that trial was over. And it would be in 2014 that the state of South Carolina would review that case and find that he actually was not guilty but the damage had already been done, all because of corruption. The interesting thing is, is we see injustices like this taking place in our world today. And it it seems as if very few people want to do anything about it. And I'll also say boldly that at times we would rather ignore it. We try to look away from it. We'd rather ignore the problem than find solutions to address it. Think about the oppression that we see today, genocide. Think of the Holocaust and six million people killed during that time. Terrorism. Over the past year, 20 or the past decade, at least 26,000 people are killed each year due to unjust terrorist attacks. Slavery. Did you know that 49.6 million people are still enslaved today in some way, shape, or form? 49.6 million. Sex trafficking. 27.6 million people are victims of sex trafficking. And then the, the, the big topic of today, abortion. Did you know in 2020, there were approximately 30,000 abortions in the state of North Carolina alone? And since the overturning of Roe versus Wade here in North Carolina, North Carolina has seen a spike of 35% more abortions since that's happened because everybody's coming into our state fleeing the states that don't allow it. And these are all pressing issues that show up on the news, and when we see it, we, we may say a prayer, we may give some money, but... Let's be honest. We're in church. We can be honest, right? A lot of times that fades away with the next news headline. We may pray about it for a minute. We may say, hey, God, can you help us in this area? But when it comes to doing things, a lot of times we just sit idle. And I think the reason why we do this is is because we think that it doesn't relate to us directly. Church, these things should break us down. These unjust acts were on the heart of Christ. And they should be on the heart of us. And we see here they're on the heart of Solomon. The teacher's looking out into society, and he's he's longing for somebody to come and and rescue them, to to save them, to to pull them out of this injustice that's happening. And he's, he's frustrated that no one seems to care about the evilness in this world. As one person said, in a culture of exploitation, he wanted to rectify the wrongs, console the victims of injustice. Twice he lamented that no one was able to offer them comfort. I want to pause right there and say a word just on behalf of Aaron Lake Baptist Church. If you find yourself in a situation of abuse and you feel like there's no way out, we are here for you. And Aaron Lake Baptist Church is a safe place for you. And if you need to talk to somebody today, whether it be in private or something like that, pull some, one of us aside, talk to us, give us a note, send us a text, whatever you got to do to get some help, we are here to help you. Aaron Lake Baptist Church is always and will be a place to protect the vulnerable. Always. And I came across another story the other day that related to the persecuted church. And this, this girl, her name is uh, Lena, is an Egyptian girl who is a devout Muslim who uh, always was taught to despise Christianity. However, one day a friend invited her to come over after school and listen to a radio program. She listened to that radio program and she heard the gospel. And so she started wondering, is, is, is God who he says he is? And is Jesus just a messenger like she's always been told? She started wrestling with these questions. Well, eventually she would come to faith in Christ, trust Jesus as Lord, and surrender to him as, as being the only way to heaven. But sadly, when she did that, she was attacked by her own family. Her father beat her. Her mother would not allow her to eat family meals. And eventually they declared, think about this, your own daughter or your own son, to declare them as good as dead to them for accepting Christ. She was thrown out of the house, was continued persecuted by her family, and in fact was eventually kidnapped 
and beaten until she was broken and unconsciousness or unconscious. These things shouldn't happen. These are things that no one should ever experience, but these are things that take place. In the real world that we live in today, they take place. These things run rampant in our every in in our life and so when we look at the world today and we look at the evil that's taking place in this world when we look at at at, at what just all seems hope is lost you can begin to ask the question and I say all that to say to bring you to the gravity of what he's wrestling with here he sees these things taking place he's understanding what's happening and he's like what is the point of all this if this is as bad as it if, if this is what it's all about what's the point Is there any hope in life? This is the weight of where Solomon's at, the teacher's at here in this text. Is life worth it? Is there hope in life? The good news is he answers the question in the next verse. Look at verse 17. I said to myself, God will judge the righteous and the wicked since there is a time for every activity and every work. See, this is one of those moments where where the preacher reminded himself about what he's been preaching. Remember what he said at the beginning in chapter 3. We talked about this last week. In verse 1, he says there's an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under the sun. So if there is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under the sun, then there must be a time for justice. Therefore, rather than simply getting angry and sad about the oppression that we see in the world, he's saying, hey, we need to trust God that he's going to make things right in the end because he will make things right in the end. It doesn't mean that we sit idle. It doesn't mean that we don't do things to to, to help and be there for people. And we need to stand up for the oppressed and the vulnerable, as we already mentioned. Depending on our place in society and the spiritual or civil authority that God has given to us, it's our responsibility to fight against oppression. As fathers and mothers and pastors and citizens and public officials, we're called to do what's right in the home, the church, and in society. And so I would, I would argue that's a biblical mandate for us to stand up for justice. You see this echoed all throughout, this same language throughout the prophets. I immediately started thinking back to, to Amos and, and him just standing on saying, hey, we need to stand up for the oppressed. There's always, but the reality is, is in our best efforts due to the sin and the curse of sin in this world, there's always going to be injustices that happen. Abuse in families. Innocent lives being taken. Police officers killed in duty. Military members killed in action. Corruption in government. So while we need to do what we can to protect the vulnerable and do what's right and seek to do what's right, we need to also keep in mind that there is a day coming where God is going to judge the wicked and the righteous. That day is coming. And so find the encouragement here. There there is hope in this life. And it's these things that give us the motivation to press on in a world that's so full of evil, that's so full of hate, and so full of injustice, and we need to remember that our confidence does not lie in the justice system. Our confidence is rather in the supreme judge who is constantly and actively ruling over all things in life. He will have the final word. He will have the final word. Reminded of Acts 17, In verse 30, where he says, Therefore, having overlooked the time of ignorance, God now commands all people to repent, because he set a day where he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man that he's appointed. And he has provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. So we keep these things in our mind. The wicked will be punished, and there will be a day when Jesus makes his return. Justice will be served. And that's what he's echoing here in verse 17. Reminded that, hey, justice is going to happen. God is going to judge them. So I do. I need to do what I can to help them, but God's going to have the final word in the end. Revelation 21.4, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, says that he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief and crying and pain will be no more. Why? Because the previous things have passed away. I Googled, uh, by the way, I, I'm always afraid to Google things, but I Googled the word news yesterday. And the top headlines were all disturbing. Somebody was killed. Some unjust situation over the world, or across overseas. Somebody being oppressed. Politicians fighting over the debt crisis. And when you see nothing but negativity, it's easy to conclude this life is meaningless. You begin to ask the question, why are we here? 
Where's God? Has he left us? Is he just taking his hand off of the world? Where is he? Are we here just one day and gone the next? See, thankfully, the Bible shows us here that there is hope in life. That we can, we can look out into this world and, we, and yeah, we can, while we can get beaten down with all the acts of injustice that are taking place, we can rest assured that a day is coming where God will give the final verdict. And this motivation, it, 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 it leads us to find comfort in knowing that God is sovereign and in control over all things. And so what does that mean for us? Well, for, for us, it, it means that we do what we can to make the world a better place living on mission for him. Seeing where we are as a light for the gospel to do what we can to, to move the ball forward and making the world a better place in light of Christ. And that's what we do until he calls us home. So if your life is in Christ, then you do have hope in this life. This world is not meaningless. We see that we have hope. But then secondly, we got to ra- wrestle with the next question. Is there hope in eternity? After looking at the present world, he then shifts his focus and he starts pondering these questions about life after death. And again, in the context of this passage, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about time. He, he starts talking about time. There's a season for this. There's a season for that. There's a time for this and a time for that. Well, now he's saying, hey, all right, now we talked about life. Now let's move to the other side. Is there hope in eternity? Look at verse 18. He said, I said to myself, this happens so that God may test the children of Adam and they may see for themselves that they are like animals. That's a weird passage. So basically what he's saying is, is our present existence, why we're here right now, is proving ground. It's a test. Not simply in the sense of something that we pass or fail, but it's in the sense of something that demonstrates our true character, who we truly are. And so here we find one of the purposes in life. As we live our life, we should begin to understand where we fit in the universe in, in light, and in particular in light of our relationship with God who created all things. That's essentially what he's saying here in this text. And in addition to that, we begin to see ourselves for who we truly are, broken people in need of a Savior. And so he's leaning in into our own mortality. And if we're honest, we make much of this life about us. We do. I do. Many of us in the room do. I would argue all of us do. But we're reminded here that what we do is meaningless. It's all vanity, right? I've been saying that all week. Everything's just vanity. It's been a very encouraging time around the office over here. (laughs) You have a problem? It's just meaningless. It's vanity. (laughs) Just kidding. All throughout human history, man has tried to elevate itself to God's status. It's been that way since the beginning. Trying to, trying to make everything about us. Man's elevating itself to the status of God. However, what we need to see is, is that we're nothing more than a creature who will eventually die. Welcome to church. You guys got dressed up to hear that this morning, right? Look at what he says in uh, verse 19 and 20. He says, For the fate of the children of Adam and the fate of animals are the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. People have no advantage over the animals since everything is futile. All are going to go to the same place, all come from dust, and all return to dust. That almost sounds like something an evolutionist would say, let alone somebody who believes in God. But let's, let's dive into this. Let's lean into this a little bit. One commentator once said that this is the Bible's strongest statement of the inevitability of death, that it's going to happen. And this is a question that we all wrestle with. This is a question that, that, that may keep some of us up at night. And the teacher's telling us, he's like, we're like animals in the sense that we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Uh, the teacher's telling us is that death is the great equalizer. Equalizes everything. i uh, just kind of illustrate this for you. Last year when we were in Pittsburgh, we were walking to go get ice cream. And as we were walking to go get ice cream, there was a dead bird on the ground. And so I just, you know, I, I, I grew up hunting, all that kind of stuff. This is a dead bird, whatever. Just step that thing and go over. All of a sudden, I look behind me, and there's one of our students in tears over a dead bird. And I'm like, what is wrong? She's like, it's a dead bird. I'm like, being the pastor that I am, right? Here's what I said. Get over it. It's a bird. (laughs) I do give better counsel than that. (laughs) 
Just not in that situation, okay? But she's like, but it's, but it's dead. It once had life, now it's dead. And I'm like, it's a bird, right? And so this kind of went on for a little bit. And the reality was in this moment, while I didn't realize it, here's why the student was upset. The student was upset because that bird that was once full of life was now dead. And then we become face-to-face with our own mortality. That we, too, will be like a dead bird, in a sense. This language here, the teacher is not, he's not putting up an argument to say that we're like animals. There's an obvious difference between us and animals, clearly. but, But one thing's for sure is that we all live and we all die. And so, church, we have this same fate. This language used by the teacher here is reminding us of the curse that we were given in Genesis 3. And here's what happened. So once we were called to rule the beast of the earth, right? God created us to rule the beast of the earth, to oversee all that. We weren't to submit to them, but the problem was is we actually did submit to one. We submitted to a serpent. And ever since then, as a result of sin, we're told that we are dust and we're going to return to dust. Psalm 49, 12 uses a similar language here. Despite his assets, mankind will not last. He's like an animal that perishes. At some point, whether we realize it or not, we all will die. We all will see that fate. And the funny thing is, is people wrestle with that a little bit differently. Uh, Famously, uh, Woody Allen famously said this way, I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Right? (laughs) I I can get down with that. (laughs) I'm sure that's how that works, but... One English writer put it this way, reached the same conclusion. If one puts aside the existence of God and the survival after life is too doubtful, one has to make up one's mind as to, use it, uh, as to the use of life. If death ends all, if I have neither hope for good nor to fear evil, I must ask myself, what am I here for? And how these circumstances must, I must conduct myself? Now the answer is plain, but so unplatable that most will not face it. There is no meaning for life, and thus life has no meaning. Because we live, and we die, and we cease to exist, based on where we stop right here. Everything's meaningless. So we have the answer. There is is hope in the fact that God will judge the world, but now he's leaning into a deeper question, what happens after we die? Where where are we going? What, what What is this? If this is all we have to look forward to in life, if we're looking at the injustices, if we're if we're just so so focused on the negativity, if that's it, then there is no hope. There's no hope in life, and there's no hope in death or in eternity. Let's keep going. 21 and 22. Who knows if the spirits of the children of Adam go upward and the spirits of animal go downward to the earth? I have seen that there is nothing better than for a person to enjoy his activities because that is his reward. For who can enable him to see what will happen after he dies? So he asks two questions. He proposes two questions here, and he leaves us hanging. But the good news is we've got more than the book of Ecclesiastes to answer that question. So in essence, he's saying here that there is a great difference between humans and animals. That The difference is linked to the final judgment. When animals die, animals cease to exist. I just offended somebody, all right? When animals die, animals will cease to exist. If they're in heaven with us, then you can tell me I'm wrong when we get there, okay? Look, but our souls are different. We don't cease to exist. One way or another, we're going to see Jesus. We're going to see him. And so that's the difference. Our our spirit goes upward. He's pointing to the reality that there's more to life than what we experience right now. And he uses a similar language at the end of the book in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. He he makes this this statement. He says, dust returns to the earth as it once was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And so let's answer the question, is there hope in eternity? I hope you will see here that the answer is yes, and it came through the finished work of Jesus. We have hope in eternity. We have hope in Jesus Christ. If we want to know what happens after death, we look at Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is able to show us what happens because he's been there. He came from there. He went back there, and one day he's coming again. Remember, Jesus was put to death on a cross. 
He, he was on the cross, yet he didn't, but he didn't stay dead. Three days after he rose from the dead, he, went, he, he left a borrowed tomb, overcoming death, the final blow, and eventually he ascended back to heaven. He's currently sitting at the right hand of God, and one day he is going to come when God says go. Now, Jesus doesn't know when that time is, so don't ask me. I have no idea. But what I do know is, is that there is a time coming when all things are going to be made new. All things are going to be corrected. And Jesus describes that for us, and we see that here. He will be the righteous judge. Everyone who believes in him will be risen to life in Christ and be with him in glory for all of eternity. Jesus prepared a place for you and for me. And if we're believers in him, we can be assured that no matter how crazy this world is and the chaos, and you guys remember, we studied Revelation for a long time, things are not going to get much better as we go forward. But praise God, he is going to make all things new. And he's going to make all things right. Is there hope in eternity? The answer to that question is yes. See the encouragement here. 2 Timothy 1.10 puts it this way. It says, There's been, it's now, this has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and has brought to life and is immortality to light through the gospel. Notice the shift here. If everything is meaningless, we're reminded of our own mortality, we're going to die. Yeah, that's true. But if we're in Christ, we don't. Death is the beginning to new life. And we rule and reign with him forever. Do we have open eternity? Yes, we do. 100%. Jesus made the way for us. At the, uh, at the end of the Battle of Gettysburg, a journalist by the name of Samuel Wilkerson was surveying the battlefield. And may I remind you that at the Battle of Gettysburg, 46,000 men, most of them younger than us in this room by a long shot, younger than me by a long shot, laid down their lives on that battlefield over three days some estimate as high as over 50,000. We just we don't really know. But while walking past the bodies, Samuel discovered that one of his sons was one of the casualties. In fact, he walked over to his son, and he was a writer for the New York Times. And here's what he wrote as he was looking at his son, and he wrote this and published this in the New York Times. He said, Oh, you dead, who at Gettysburg have baptized with your body, or have baptized your, let me read, let me reread that. He says, O oh, you dead, who at Gettysburg have baptized with your blood the second birth of freedom in America? How you are to be envied. I rise from a grave whose set clay I have passionately kissed. I look up and I see Christ spanning this battlefield with his feet reaching fraternally and lovingly up to heaven. His right hand's open, the gates of paradise, and his left beckons of those mutilated, bloody, swollen forms to ascend. So what he's talking about there is the, the fact that when we die, we raise to life with him. In Christ, there's a day coming when we will rise with him, and while our bodies may fade to dust, our souls don't. And we'll be reunited with our glorified bodies, and we'll spend eternity with him having a better understanding of what hope looks like in eternity. No more pain, no more suffering. So there's two points of application here, and then we're going to close and actually do something real special here in just a second before we leave. But the first one is if you don't know Jesus, if you've never placed your trust in him, the Bible says that nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man knows. Why are you waiting? Without Christ, this world is meaningless. The world is meaningless without a Savior who came to redeem it. Well, he came, and he's provided a way for us. Are you tired of trying to find satisfaction in this world that only leaves you questioning life's deepest questions is because there's nothing here to satisfy you? Mick Jagger was right. I can't get no satisfaction, not in this world. No matter how hard you try. And I try and I try and I try, right? 
Jesus is the only thing that can satisfy your soul. He calls us. He says, come drink from this water that gives you what? Eternal life, right? What you've been searching for is only found in him. So you can keep searching and keep discovering that it's meaningless. Or you say, you know what? There may be a little something about this Jesus dude. Let me, let me find that out. Jesus has opened his arms to you today. Would you come to him? Secondly, for us as believers in the room, in a world where all hope is lost and everything is meaningless, what do we do? Well, we always remember that Jesus made a way for us to have hope. To have hope in this life and hope in eternity. There's a statement that he makes here that I don't want to overlook. It's in verse 22 of chapter 3. And he says, I've seen that there is nothing better than for a person to enjoy his activities because that's his reward. What's that saying is, is that we can find joy in the work and labor and what we do because of Christ. We see that reflected all throughout the Bible. So we press on in this world, focusing on our work, finding joy in our work, honoring God through our work, and we do that until Jesus calls us home. But we can consider those things a joy and trust that God's sovereignly ruling over these things. We keep faith and we keep hope and we press on in a world that's full of injustice and oppression. Is there a hope in life? Yes. That's because God's going to come and redeem it. He's going to judge the righteous and the wicked. Those who, those who are doing the oppressing, they will get what they deserve in the end. No doubt. God always steps in for the vulnerable and the oppressed. Always. Is there hope in eternity? Yes. Because Jesus gives us the opportunity to go there with him. He's been there. He's come back. He's gone there again. And he's coming back, and he's going to take us with him. And for that, we're grateful, and we have hope in eternity. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the everlasting hope that we have in you, the hope that we have beyond this life. What a joy it is to know you. Father, I pray that today, if there's somebody who doesn't know you, they would come to know you, that they would cry out to you in their own way and say, God, I need you. This world's meaningless. And I surrender my life to you. Forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for the sin in my life that separates me from you. Come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. I want that eternal life. I want that hope that only Christ offers. I want the satisfaction that only comes in a relationship with him. Lord, if there's somebody here that does that today, I pray that they would pray that prayer. I pray they'd come today to a saving faith in you. God, for those of us that are here it's so hard to be a Christian in this world. Seems like things are getting worse. But Lord, let us be reminded today that you are going to come and you are going to redeem this world. You're going to judge the you're going to judge the righteous and the wicked. And you're going to make all things new. And so Father, help us to press on in a way that honors you and glorifies you with our life. In our schools, in our jobs, Wherever we go, may we honor you. That's why we're here. This life's not about us. Forgive us for trying to make it so much about us because it's only about you. Use us, Lord. And we lift all this up to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.